I am so thrilled uh, that uh, so many folks uh, have joined us tonight. Uh, I won't be boring you for too long. My name is Addy. I'm one of the organizers with uh, New One is Illegal Fredericton. Uh, I am coming to you uh, from unceded uh, Wolastikwe, uh, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy territory here in Fredericton. Uh, if you are tuning in from elsewhere, uh, feel free to, to send a message in to the chat and let us know uh, what traditional territory you are tuning in from. Um, as we continue with tonight's event, where we will be talking about migrant experiences uh, in Canada, uh, we want to do that uh, while we remember that we are uh, on stolen land uh, and we benefit as settlers continually from the colonial project that we know to be Canada. Uh, it gives me uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Anna Siroy, who is going to be uh, moderating tonight's event. Um, uh, Anna uh, is uh, a, uh, a final year student at uh, St. Thomas University in Human Rights. Uh, and before I was supposed to do that, before I did that, I was supposed to tell you about why we're having this event. So I'm going to do that now, uh, out of order. Um, and what, why we're doing this event now is because uh, on Sunday, this, this past Sunday, was Refugee Rights Day in Canada. Um, Refugee Rights Day is commemorated on April 4th every year in Canada to bring attention to the 1985 Supreme Court of Canada ruling recognizing that refugee claimants are entitled to fundamental justice. Uh, April 4th, 1985 was a milestone. Uh, on that day, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects the right of refugee claimants in Canada to life, liberty, and security of the person, and that claimants are therefore entitled to an oral hearing in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice and international law, and it led to the creation of the Immigration and Refugee Board. The ruling has come to be known as the Singh decision in recognition of Harbhajan Singh, Sadhu Singh Tandi, Paramjit Singh Man, Kewal Singh, Charanjit Singh Gil, Indrani and Satnam Singh, who brought their cases uh, to the court. Uh, and that's Refugee Rights Day. Uh, I should also note that uh, No One Is Illegal is a, an international collective of, of activists, uh, advocates, migrants, uh, allies, uh, all working to build a, a world uh, that, is, that is free of, of, of the violence of borders. Uh, and uh, uh, we're really excited that you're all here tonight to, to uh, partake in this, in this very important conversation. So with that, uh, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Addy, for opening the event and for that introduction. Um, I will be the MC for tonight and I'll be asking our panelists the questions. To introduce our panelists, first we have Justin Mohammed. Justin is a lawyer living and working in Ottawa, Ontario, specializing in international human rights law and international humanitarian law. Prior to his current role with Amnesty International Canada, he clerked at the Federal Court of Canada, served as a human rights officer with the United Nations peacekeeping mission in Mali, and worked as an analyst at the Library of Parliament for the House of Commons Subcommittee on International Human Rights. And our other panel panelist, Jeremias Teku, is a Fredericton resident and settlement worker. He is a survivor of the anti-Indigenous massacres in Guatemala, whose story is the subject of a new book entitled In the Arms of Inep the extraordinary story of a Guatemalan survivor and his quest for healing from trauma by Moncton-based writer and therapist Eve, Eves Mil Mills Allen. So it's my pleasure to now bring, uh, give the stage to both Justin and Jeremias to start. Uh, Justin, you have the floor to give a little bit of an intro and in what you do. Thanks so much, uh, Anna. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you uh, all uh, today and to share uh, the space with uh, my co-panelist, Jeremy. Uh, I'm just uh, being able to hear about your experiences and, and um, your, your lived experience, I think, will be uh, really uh, insightful for everyone who's joining here today. And I know I'm personally very much looking forward to that. Um, uh, so, as was mentioned, uh, a little bit about my former roles. I'm currently the human rights law and policy campaigner at Amnesty International Canada. Uh, and among the issues that I work on uh, are refugee rights in, um, in Canada. 
uh, it's really a pleasure to be doing uh, 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 this panel in the context of, uh, of Refugee Rights Day in Canada, which Abby has obviously already explained the meaning. Um, and I think it's really, it's really just worth uh, underlining that, uh, that that decision um, has a, a very important place in, in Canadian law. Um, and, and of course, that it did affirm the rights of life, liberty, and security of the person um, to refugee claimants, uh, but really broader than that, that it's about all people who are present uh, in Canada, not just Canadian citizens. Uh, and that is really the significance of that, uh, of, that, um, of that decision and, of course, the oral hearing process that came out as a result of it. Uh, so I'm joining you today from uh, unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory in, in Ottawa and really just pleased to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm hoping to spend the next 10 minutes or so uh, with a couple of my to, to explain a couple of my thoughts uh, about um, the, the question that was posed, which is around the ongoing erosion of refugee rights in Canada. Uh, and I, I hope that um, uh, I will make the case that the answer to that question, uh, whether there is uh, 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 an ongoing erosion of refugee rights in Canada, I'm hoping to make to you the case that uh, the answer to that question is uh, absolutely and a definitive yes. Uh, so in order to sort of support uh, the, the position that I'm taking, I, I want to speak about three measures uh, that will illustrate this trend. Uh, the first one is with respect to Bill C-97. That's a piece of legislation that was introduced in uh, 2019, uh, uh, formerly. Uh, the Safe Third Country Agreement um, that's uh, been in place now for a number of years and the pandemic measures that have been, uh, that have been put in place by the current government. Uh, through um, orders and council, which are effectively decisions of the of the cabinet. Uh, before I kind of get into those three pieces, I think it's important to acknowledge that Canada has been a leader, and and some of uh, some of you may have have seen and heard uh, that Canada is uh, one of the countries that has been resettling uh, actually the most numbers of refugees uh, from around the world. I think that is really important to acknowledge that there is a protection role that Canada is playing in that regard. But the pieces that I want to talk about tonight are really important because they they deal with territorial protection. That is what Canada is supposed to do when someone comes to uh, our, our borders and our territory and claims protection. And no amount of resettling refugees from the international community uh, pulls away from the obligations, the legal obligations that Canada has signed up um, with respect to protecting people who find uh, themselves uh, on, on our territory and looking to make a claim for refugee protection. So the first measure, uh, Bill C-97, uh, was, me was a measure that was introduced in 2019. And what this did was it removed the possibility of refugee claimants uh, from having their claims referred to the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada if they had made a claim in uh, one of four countries previously. So in Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, or the United States. And the significance of that is, of course, that the Immigration and Refugee Board is the administrative tribunal. It's like a court that decides when somebody comes to Canada and makes a claim for refugee protection, uh, whether or not they meet the, the requirements of, of refugee law. Uh, what's happening with, uh, what, what happened as a result of what was brought in in, in this Bill C-97 was that rather than sending claims to be referred to the Immigration and Refugee Board, they were sent to a government official who would make a decision uh, as to whether or not that person uh, should, should benefit effectively from, from Canada's protection. Um, this was really problematic. This is really problematic for a number of reasons. Um, first, the ineligibility provision is very vast. Uh, it's not limited by the time when a prior claim was made, the context, uh, the fairness of the procedure that they might have received in one of those other countries when they made the refugee claim, um, or any other reason that they might want Canada's protection as opposed to another country. And I'll get to that in when we talk a little bit about the Safe Third Country Agreement, because it's really important to note that many of these countries are actually not very safe for refugees. And in the context of Australia, we can think about their offshore, uh, you know, their, their policy of moving uh, refugees offshore to, to process them and the human rights violations that have come from that, or the United States, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, this procedure is also discriminatory. Uh, it gives some claimants access to an independent review tribunal, uh, you know, namely those who don't, who aren't excluded by this new measure in C-97. And it provides a sort of uh, second class process for those who are uh, captured, unfortunately, by the provisions that were, in, that were brought in by Bill C-97 in that omnibus um, uh, piece of legislation. Uh, there are also some procedural def deficiencies with that, that, um, that inferior process, namely, for example, the fact that there's no transcript of the hearing. So whereas the IRB is like a court and there's a transcript that can be produced uh, for these claimants, there's not uh, that process. 
Um, so moving on to the Safe Third Country Agreement, uh, that's an agreement that was uh, signed between Canada and the United States and came into effect in 2004. Uh, subject to a few narrow exceptions, what this agreement does, it means that individuals who are seeking asylum um, entering Canada from the United States at land ports of entry are deemed ineligible to have their claims referred to the Immigration and Refugee Board, and instead they are returned back to the United States to make their claim there. Uh, Amnesty International, the organization that I work for, alongside uh, a number of other organizations, uh, including the uh, Canadian Council for Refugees and the Canadian Council of Churches, and some very brave claimants who brought uh, a case to federal court and actually talked about their lived experience of the Safe Third Country Agreement, challenged this in court recently, and the federal court uh, uh, found in July of last year that the agreement violates Section 7 of the, of the Canadian Charter, the very same section that we uh, celebrate uh, when we talk about um, uh, Refugee Rights Day. Uh, so the judge in that case found that the treatment of, of people who are returned under this agreement, for example, when they're subjected to immigration detention, would shock the conscience of Canadians. Um, but also that those who are returned to the United States would face a heightened risk of refoulement, and refoulement is the forcible return of a refugee protection claimant to a country where they might face uh, persecution. Uh, so unfortunately, what we've seen is that although there have been these very clear uh, decisions from the federal court, and I've talked about the most recent one, but actually this, this decision has been challenged previously at the federal court, and again, violations of Section 7 were found in those cases. Uh, unfortunately, we see that the government has decided to appeal that decision, and um, it's most recently been uh, heard before the Federal Court of Appeal, and now uh, we're waiting for a decision to see uh, whether or not um, the, the Canadian law and the state third country agreement will be upheld. Uh, I know I probably only have a few minutes left, so I'll very briefly move on to the pandemic measures, and so those are the orders in council that have been uh, adopted by the government of Canada since this pandemic uh, began. Uh, in Canada, or at least that it had an impact uh, in Canada. Um, as you know, uh, many of you would know that the border was closed on March 20th of last year. And since then, uh, a slew of restrictions against uh, cross-border traveling uh, have been lifted. So for example, uh, family members of citizens and permanent residents are able to apply uh, to cross uh, into Canada. Uh, workers, students, um, others for whom uh, compassionate entry has been approved to attend funerals or, or other, um, uh, uh, other uh, ceremonies. All of that has been approved and yet millions of entries, um, so millions of entries have been approved, but uh, unfortunately uh, no exceptions have been made uh, with respect to refugees except the, the very same ones that apply uh, under the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, so those measures that, that those orders in council have been renewed uh, 16 times uh, without a single day of oversight from the Canadian Parliament. The decision is taken exclusively by cabinet and it's renewed every uh, approximately every 30 days. Now the concerns about turning people back uh, under these order in orders in council are not abstract. Uh, we at Amnesty and, and several other organizations have documented cases where people have been arrested upon return to the United States, subject therefore to the same types of conditions that we just talked about under the Safe Third Country Agreement, where the federal court had found that um, that people were being turned back and, and facing a risk of mistreatment. Um, so that really shouldn't have come as a surprise with respect to the orders in council, because we knew it was happening under the Safe Third Country Agreement. Uh, and finally, we know of at least one case of an asylum seeker who was deported from the United States after being turned away from Canada. And this, in my view, uh, renders Canada complicit in the uh, abuses that uh, that American authorities are um, can be committing when we turn people back at the border. Um, so uh, I think I'll probably tie up my remarks there. Uh, I do uh, want to just say if at some point we can share um, maybe in the chat uh, an action that Amnesty International has out on that, that last measure that I mentioned, the order in council. We do have an action where folks can call the, the Minister um, of Citizenship and Immigration and Refugees Canada and let them know what they think about this. And there's an entire step-by-step -step, um, process that you can use to, to call and voice your concerns if you wish to do so. So I don't know if I can uh, ask the, the um, my colleagues if we can put that in the chat. But Yeah, thank you so much, Justin. Maybe that's something we can do during the question and answer period. Um, as a directory for people to follow. Next, I'll give the floor to Jeremias. It's all yours. Uh, buenas tardes, everybody. My name is Jeremias Teku, and uh, I came here as a refugee almost 20 years ago 
coming from Guatemala. Uh, a little bit about myself before to coming a refugee myself. Uh, I was doing uh, working with uh, refugees from my fellow Guatemalan um, and countries family. So we're uh, resettled in a refugee camp in Mexico. So I was working for the Catholic Church and there's some uh, many programs for the UNHCR uh, sponsor uh, uh, this program. So uh, pretty much like doing a resettlement worker there and didn't know that one day I'm becoming a refugee too. So uh, pretty much as Justin explained, like uh, in terms of uh, making a climate over uh, in a country where it's supposed to be in peace, so the government of Canada or country doesn't allow you to go out because wh why are you looking for a uh, refugee status when you are in a peaceful country, right? So in Guatemala, they, they, they signed a peace agreement after the civil war in 1996. And here is Jeremias applying in the 2000 uh, to become a refugee in Canada. So that's uh, for our government, our local government wasn't like, uh, uh, this is unacceptable, right? So, and uh, thank you to uh, uh, to United Church of Canada and uh, the BTS, uh, Breaking the Silence Network, uh, Guatemala Network in uh, Human Rights Work here in the Maritimes uh, that uh, pretty much they sponsored me to becoming a refugee here in Canada. Without their support, I shouldn't be here in Canada because uh, as I said, there is so much, uh, many papers that you have to fill. And uh, my experience by applying for refugee status here, my, uh, it was rejected uh, from the beginning. Uh, I was told that uh, I have to fill my form and wait at least two years. Um, a little bit about myself, why I did ask for refugee status. I was kidnapped uh, in 1999 and all the situation of persecution didn't stop and uh, uh, I was really, really like, uh, and this is part of my story. That's why part of uh, what I explained it in the in the arm of Eno, of my bio. So, uh, I, we uh, we decide to apply for refugee status here in Canada because of the the situation that uh, my family was in there. My little son, who was three years at the time, my wife that uh, she was studying at the time, she did not do anything with all what I was doing as a human rights advocate, but also my, my commitment with, uh, with refugees in my country. So then the story switched to working as a settlement worker, uh, working with refugees in Guatemala to become a refugee. So that's how the story flipped. And there you go, and they appeared in Canada as a refugee. And uh, once again, uh, as an advocate in uh, human rights in Guatemala, coming here in Canada with the trauma of saying, what I'm doing here, like, I am so proud to say I'm a human rights advocate, but being here as a refugee and being kidnapped because of something that you were doing, and then where are you gonna go from here and from now on? So then I was so fortunate that I connected uh, uh, the, MC, the Multicultural Association of Freight and welcomed me. They provide me the language program and they help me to, with my family to settle. So, with this, and uh, I pretty much put myself to learn uh, a new language into my my uh, list of language that I have and must to know because I don't have another way. So if I'm I was, uh, if I'm gonna be able to to do the work that I was passionate about it, the human rights, not just from here, it's in Canada, but also overseas in Latin America in terms of human rights. So. Uh, there is so much to be done. So then through my experience uh, working with refugees in Guatemala and being an advocate and being here, I just have to do something very important, which was English. And it wasn't easy. As a refugee and with all the trauma that you carry on and, uh, and you don't have the support that you're supposed to be having in terms of, for example, mental health, like mental health uh, here in Canada and in, in, in Guatemala, so my descent, I don't know what mental health means until I came to Canada, post-traumatic stress in capital and the mental health and post-traumatic stress and the psychology and psychiatric and you don't know where to go. It's like pretty much a, a basketball ball going there and bouncing up and coming back and you don't know where to go. And that was part of the frustration from the beginning. And, and then the, the, the complexity of understanding where I'm gonna, where I'm supposed to go now, right? And thanks to, to my teachers and 
all the people who welcome me here in Fredericton. And even though like uh, it was in English, but you feel welcome. And that's how I overcome and end up in university, pushing myself to learn English. And then guess what? After one year, I start to work with MCF as a settlement worker. I do the resettlement assistant program for so long. And uh, then in 2009, I start to work as a settlement worker in school. So which, which I'm saying pretty much that the blessing of having the opportunity to help out your fellow uh, immigrants, refugee, because we know the story. We did not, first, we did not choose to be. It's, we were forced to leave our country. We were forced, even though this is something like I'm really pleased and to share this experience as a refugee, because once again, it's, there is the, com the complexity of understanding who's a refugee and the, and the stereotyping by saying, oh, there is once again like a herek, and there is a once again like taking away our job or taking away opportunity for Canadians. And that is, no, we're here like, uh, we didn't choose first, but secondly, we bring so much into the country. We reached in Canada. So once again, it's uh, uh, over, uh, overall, like all what has been happening is the contribution that we're bringing back to the community. We're bringing back to the country. My experience in COVID time, as uh, Justin uh, was sharing in terms of law and regulation and all the rights or the human rights of, of refugee or immigrants here in Canada, I was very, a little bit surprised and, uh, and uh, annoying by reading the news when COVID started because the door has to be locked down, right? But then the conversation is not, uh, we still have an open door for um, immigrants who are gonna be the temporary foreign workers. So then uh, the message then, what has been put in the table is the economy is very important, but the human rights of the people who are waiting to be coming in Canada for such a long time, they have to wait. And that wait, it's, if, we, if we're gonna be talking in, in, in looking into human rights spectrum, so many of this family that we may know, not know what's gonna happen, what can happen to them. And why I'm saying that is because when I experienced that a day for me being back in Guatemala can be my life. That, that uh, because my life to, to, to be at risk because it, we're in limbo. There is no day, there is not a time that we can wait, right? So in terms of COVID uh, also, because of my expertise and working with, uh, with uh, the young, young and beautiful, powerful little, little refugee who are the five years old and 18 years old, the children and youth in the school. There is so much beautiful things that we should honor. And unfortunately, because it's a five years old or it's a youth and doesn't have the language, usually the problem is that we ignore that there is a human being behind that individual. And this is something like probably we say as a, as a settlement worker in the school, we're trying to embrace that and bring it back to, to mm -hmm. the school, to the, to the principal and saying, hey, he doesn't know English, but he has feelings. They don't know English yet, but there is so much that they can collaborate, culture speaking, and there is so much to, to bring to the table. The same with the parents. We make the connection, we make things happen. In COVID time, thank you to our school here, our school district and the Minister of Education. COVID time, okay, we're gonna make it things happen like in virtual right now. But never ask if they, our student, they know how to use a computer. One to 10 of my clients, perhaps six that I know how to use a computer. So then, thank you, but should we ask first how we're gonna deliver this and who's gonna do such job? So I, I, I really, I'm, I'm really grateful and please don't take me wrong. This is very important, but in COVID time, it's, this is how we correspond and who can do, what is our part and our role into this challenging time, right? So I, um, uh, that's where uh, I see in, uh, the, the situation happening and, in the meantime, like in terms of quarantine, yes, as a settlement agencies across the country and to my own experience, when we have the first influx of the Syrians, Fredericton community, they were so vibrant. They were so eager to welcome. So if we're gonna be listening, yes, 
from the citizen of Can the Canadian, overall, Fredericton, New Brunswick, or the Atlantic, were willing to welcome newcomers. And yes, there is a COVID protocol to follow. Yes, we follow that and we welcome any family before something is gonna happen. Because the pandemic of, of COVID, maybe that, that is not the worst thing that we've been seeing. There is more thing worse that is, is happening in another part of the world. So that's, I mean, saying that, that is where, and uh, just echo what Justin saying, Canada has been champion, but I think we can do better job in terms of welcoming newcomers to Canada. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for your story um, and for shining light on those issues. We're super happy to have you here as part of this panel. Uh, now, before we begin to uh, the next questions from the audience, um, we have a couple of questions for you both. So my first question for the evening is for you, Justin. You talked about the changes Canada brought in with respect to removing access to the Immigration and Refugee Tribunal tribunal for certain refugees if they are coming to Canada via the US, UK, New Zealand, and Australia. What kind of position has the uh, UNHRC taken? Uh, did they agree or disagree with the government of Canada's changes that have removed access to the RRB for refugees claimants? Thanks. Uh, thanks for that question, Anna. Um, so uh, in the lead up to uh, the implementation of uh, C-97, um, there was testimony that was heard in the Parliament of Canada, the, the Citizenship and Immigration uh, Committee held a hearing uh, on this issue where uh, many, um, you know, refugee rights advocates were, were asked to testify and, uh, and speak to this issue. Um, I don't know where the UNHCR's current policy, if they've, uh, if they've followed uh, a little bit further, what the impact of this measure has been on refugee claimants who are coming from that, uh, from any of those, those countries where they had made a claim um, previously. I'm not sure that that's been, that's been followed. But at the time, uh, the UNHCR was of the position that, um, that these uh, measures were, uh, were consistent with the, the Refugee Convention. And on this, um, uh, you know, I do have to say that uh, organizations like Amnesty International and, and of course, from my own analysis and my own understanding of our obligations on the, under the Refugee Convention, um, this, this is not the case. Um, for the reasons that I, that I brought up, there are, a, there are documents that the UNHCR had, had provided previously and, and others uh, about uh, categorical bans to refugee protections for certain classes of people, including the way that this measure has been developed and, and executed, which is entire classes of people who have done this one thing, which is make a claim for refugee protection in another country. What about that is inconsistent with Canada's international legal obligations is that there's nothing in the Refugee Convention that talks about having made a claim in a, in a, in a previous country. Once somebody presents themselves in Canada to make a, you know, they're, they're physically present and they, they want to make a claim for refugee protection. Um, there is nothing in the Refugee Convention that would prevent them from doing so. Um, the Refugee Convention only talks about some very, very unique circumstances. Uh, and those include, uh, you know, participation, for example, in war crimes. Uh, those, you know, you, you would be considered excluded from refugee protection if that were the case. Um, but there's no other reason for blanket measures to be adopted in that way. Uh, and so uh, to my understanding, I'm, I'm not sure that the UNHCR has taken a position on that since, but at the time, refugee rights organizations were on one side of that question, namely saying that the measures were inappropriate. And unfortunately, um, the UNHCR uh, was, was of the position that it was consistent. Awesome, thank you so much. And Jeremias, uh, my next question for you is, what are the supports or lack of supports for newcomers in New Brunswick, given that New Brunswick is very vocal about newcomers coming to the province? I think, uh, as uh, I mentioned, like uh, in terms of settlement agencies, we're trying our best uh, to do our job. And unfortunately, in COVID time, uh, uh, in our department, for example, we sort of like a very uh, in my department, for example, we were six people as a settlement working in school. And in COVID time, we should, we, they lay off four people. So we end up doing the work like two people. So in terms of services and the quality of our job, 
I think as much as we can, we're working like Sunday to Sunday because we're passionate about our job. The situation is yes, two, we can do the work of six. I think there is more, I think with this more commit, uh, if there is most commitment from citizenship and immigration and, and our provincial government too, in terms of welcoming newcomers in, in our community. You know, so I think, uh, as I say, like uh, we as a settlement agency, we're trying to respond as much as we can. And uh, but in, in terms of delivering the program in a quality way, what's supposed to be, I think we need to improve so much. And uh, that's uh, where we don't, uh, we still not seeing uh, in that. So we just uh, have our new fiscal year. So we hope that things is gonna be changing. And because uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, there is uh, too much uh, in terms of integration and helping newcomers to integrate. And what I'm talking about that is uh, because I'm working with the children and you too, like in order to, to facilitate the integration of, of newcomers, we have to invest, we have to tackle the situation right now and right away. And if we if we are talking about integration, we have to talk about education as a key. And uh, and we we if we're, we're going to go in the school, for example, education, sometimes we are lacking in, in ESL teachers. And why? Because the provincial government doesn't have the resources to implement to welcome new common uh, student in school. So yes, there is ESL the uh, classes, but it's just half an hour or one hour, for example, right? So. And then another aspect that I want to talk about it because I'm working, we are working with so many cases, is the mental health and well-being of the youth. So, and, and if we're gonna see it, the children and youth, but we are always seeing parents too. So in COVID, mental health is not in black and white. This is for everybody. But newcomers, they are so vulnerable because we carry one. Perhaps we don't bring luggage with us, but the luggage we're bringing with in our trauma. And when, when it, we're coming here in COVID time, it's crucial. And, and then when we're, we're gonna look for support here in our community, sometimes the professional, they are overwhelmed with work too. That when we bring in a newcomer in the, at the door, they're, perhaps they're not prepared because first of all, the newcomer doesn't speak the language, either French or English. And another thing, uh, as, a, as a multicultural association, we say, no, we can bring interpreter. No, but for confidential, we cannot do that. That is the professional. So once again, as a, as a, as a provincial, I think we have to be creative and we have to con collaborate with, uh, with the, the system and trying to, to advocate, but also bring in some type of solution with that. And, and I think the system, they should be open to, to some of this creativity of healing and support for newcomers to the province of New Brunswick. Awesome, thank you so much for that answer. Uh, my next question to you, Justin, is um, how have these refugee protections in Canada been upheld so far? Has Canada committed to its obligations? Oh, I think you're muted, Justin. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that question. Um, and I, I should have actually clarified uh, in my previous one that the, the UNHCR, that's the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And that's the agency that's responsible um, for um, uh, doing refugee resettlement, but they're also sort of known as the, orga the UN organization, which is sort of the, the, um, the organization which has an expertise within the UN uh, with respect to um, refugee issues and, and of course the refugee convention. Uh, which is kind of leads me into the, the answer to, to your question. Um, so yes, uh, Canada does have international um, uh, obligations uh, under, the, in, under the Refugee Convention. So that's a convention that was signed uh, in uh, or created in 1951 um, and of which Canada is a, a, a member. Uh, there was also uh, what they call an additional protocol to that treaty um, in 1967 which basically um, broadened the definition of a, of a refugee. So 1951, the specific historical context was the Second World War, people who had been displaced throughout Europe. There were temporal and geographic limitations in the original 1951 convention that really dealt with, with Europe. Uh, the 67 protocol basically broadens that, um, broadens that out. So what Canada has done 
for the most part, is looked at the um, the requirements that, that that you know the definition, for example, of a refugee that's found in the Refugee Convention, and incorporated that into Canadian law. And the Canadian law that deals with that domestically is the Immigration and Refugee uh, Protection Act, which more or less reflects the principles that that exist in the Refugee Convention. But as hopefully uh, I've been able to indicate through my my comments there are little changes that have been made to Canadian law in a variety of different ways um, that really defeat those, those protections as they exist in the Refugee Convention. So the two, you know, the two primary examples that, that I've given that would, would relate to that problem are the, the C-97. So you know, a decision in an omnibus budget bill uh, that was dealing with all kinds of things they you know, put a clause, the government proposed in that budget bill, a clause that would change the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. So it changed it in a way that, as I hope I've argued to you successfully, that, uh, that defeats uh, Canada's obligations under the Refugee Convention. Uh, the other one is, is a little bit different uh, with respect to uh, the orders in council, the, the pandemic measures that have been adopted. Here again, those measures are, are a legal measure that's been, that's been taken. But they're not, I would, I would argue, they're not consistent with Canada's international legal obligations under the Refugee Convention. The Refugee Convention does provide some, and, and particularly with the UNHCR, they've provided some guidance with respect to measures that can be taken in the context of a pandemic, for example. But that guidance has talked about the measures being temporary, being non-discriminatory, being, um, you know, maximally needing, needing to really maximize the protection for refugees while recognizing the public health imperatives. And what I would suggest is that one year later, we're seeing all kinds of other cross-border movement happening. So why can't the same provisions that are allowing, uh, you know, any of those public health measures that are being taken to allow all kinds of other, you know, Canadians, their relatives, uh, permanent residents to enter Canada, why, why not refugees? And unfortunately, I don't think that there's a very good answer to that question. And it's certainly, I don't think that there's an answer to that question that's consistent with our, with our obligations in the Refugee Convention. So even without the public health uh, question uh, that, that exists, I, I think there, there is this issue of, well, if there's a 14 day quarantine and that's good enough for you know, uh, somebody who's coming here to visit a relative, for example, then why can't we? Why why would that protection not be available for refugee uh, claimants? And unfortunately, I don't think the government has provided uh, a sufficient rationale for that either. Thank you so much, Justin. And I'm going to ask Hermia a similar question: um, How has Fredericton and New Brunswick upheld these refugee rights? Uh, have they also committed to these refugee rights protections and Canada's obligations? What do they look like? Well, once again, it's uh, because uh, uh, the uh, pretty much the agency where I'm working, it's uh, uh, we getting support, uh, financial support from the federal government and the provincial government in terms of delivering programs. And uh, as uh, as once again, it's we're trying our best to deliver programs. But once again, it's uh, in terms of getting the families here, and uh, in in terms of how many families uh, per capita we we get and uh, when uh, in COVID time, that like, yes, uh, there is some stop, but then uh, we have to keep continue uh, serving the newcomers in terms of providing English program as a second language, uh, also providing uh, the children support programs. In COVID time, definitely it was crucial and it's still crucial. And uh, this is out of our hand, but as a settlement agency, we're trying our best to uh, do uh, the best as we can. Uh, in general, uh, yes, so, uh, but once again, yes, uh, going back to a little bit uh, uh, talking about uh, the protection of refugee, but also the experience of uh, uh, when we, we, which we don't have that big amount of number as in comparison to big centers in terms of like temporary foreign workers or somebody who's looking for a, a refugee claimant, for example, uh, there is pretty much no support for them. And we end up helping the, them individually, for example. And in this matter, because uh, for instance, because it's a Spanish speakers, I, uh, I personally with another colleagues who speak Spanish, we try to support them, you know? So 
And once again, uh, sometimes, uh, not, not so many, sometimes it's our, our last uh, three or five experience that we have families uh, because they were based, uh, their front entrance was Montreal. So when we try to, uh, we as a, here as a, no one is legal here in Fredericton, we try to support them. And, uh, and then when we look into legal support, we, had, we were lacking in, in terms of like providing the support because they were based in Montreal, right? So, uh, so our experience with uh, our last uh, three families, they had to go back to Montreal. Why is that? Because not because uh, uh, we don't want to support them, is the support is not here. So uh, yes, the settlement agency is here helping, but you, uh, Immigration Canada is probably saying that your work is with people who got the status as a refugee here in Canada. So once again, is when we're talking about protection, is what what is this, and how how we're going to be serving, how we're going to be protecting the human rights of these families, right? So, uh, so that's it's it's, uh, it's uh, pretty much like my answer in, in terms of like here in New Brunswick and uh, personal experience, and uh, sometimes we'll have to play many hats in order to support and and help uh, uh, the newcomers families. Thank you so much. Uh, we have two more questions, one for each of the panelists. So the next question for you, Justin, is what needs to be done at an international and national level moving forward to ensure refugee rights continue to be protected in Canada? And how is this achievable? Yeah, this is uh, this is the big question, um, and, and it's always a, a difficult one to answer. Um, we've had these these obligations uh, for for a long time, and uh, the convention, uh, the Refugee Convention, is facing um, you know it's it, it's facing challenges uh, in terms of number one the number of people who are you know looking looking for protection, but also the factors that are that are causing people to be displaced. Um, you know, one of the the things obviously that uh, has has received a lot of attention in in the recent past is. The impact of climate change and the the fact that that is forcing people to move also across borders. Uh, how does the refugee well the refugee protection doesn't provide an answer to that, um, but it doesn't mean that the human rights issues and the protections that 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 are that that may be necessary um, aren't aren't the very same or that the um, the threats that come as a result of things like climate change or or a number of of other factors that just weren't contemplated in the original refugee convention. Um, might not be any less um, of a threat uh, to life, liberty, security of the person, again, to, to take the language of, of Section 7 of the Charter and Singh, um, that, you know, that, that those, are, those are new challenges that are being faced. Um, what I can say, though, is that the, that the Convention um, and even some of, you know, the UNHCR's own tools uh, uh, provide some, uh, some minimal guarantees and minimal level of protections uh, that, that just need to be met, uh, and that's that needs to be done. And, and partly, I think that that needs to be done at a political level. Um, it's to get our, uh, our elected politicians to recognize that Canada um, has these commitments, these obligations, uh, even in speaking with you today, I think you will probably notice that many, many of these things are, can be very technical from a legal perspective, they have real impacts on people's lives. And so making sure that our elected politicians understand the rationale behind these measures and why they're so important uh, uh, to refugee claimants, I think is one thing that um, needs to be done. Um, and, and perhaps in addressing the, the challenge that I posed, one thing that I would suggest um, in closing is also just to recognize that refugee rights are human rights, right? And so there's an entire set of rights that applies not just to refugees, um, but does apply to refugees or people who are claiming refugee protection that also need to be um, that also need to be recognized, upheld, and protected. So I'll just give one example from a piece of work that um, Amnesty International has worked on in the past, and we'll be working on in the future uh, with respect to um, you know immigration detention, um, which sometimes is is a is something that happens to uh, to refugees who who want to make a claim in Canada, um, and you know even in the context of even even if that person has been subject to immigration detention and there's not something in the refugee convention that, that can help them. We can think about all of the other protections that should be there, for example, from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that people should not be arbitrary, arbitrarily detained. 
Well, that's a provision that I think is really important to apply to, you know, to people who are in immigration detention, for example, um, and, and that could include refugees. Um, you know, rights of migrants workers, that's another, that's another um, you know, there's a convention which Canada has not unfortunately uh, signed on to that protects the rights of migrant workers. And so these are all, these are all international legal tools that are available and they're not necessarily, you know, they're, they're not, they don't exclude refugees. And I think we need to be thinking about uh, where those other, you know, core international human rights instruments can provide, uh, can provide protections as well and not just necessarily look at, look through the lens of the refugee convention. It's important, but it's certainly not the only, um, you know, the only international law instrument that's applicable to refugees and should provide uh, protection for refugees. Thank you so much. Um, now a final question for Hermias. You have touched on the lack of supports. One of these supports is missing um, support for housing. We are hearing this as known as illegal too, that people who arrive here are finding it difficult to find a place to live. We saw the CBC story about Dune Street as well and housing is front and center right now in the media. Can you talk a little bit about what we need to do on housing, particularly to support refugees and migrants in New Brunswick? Well, I think uh, it's, uh, it's not just, uh, I'm gonna be frank, honest on this, it's not just because of immigration. I think it's uh, all across Canada that uh, the problem of housing, it's a big ch challenging problem. And uh, for us, it's a really extreme, if it's a challenge for New Brunswick, if a Bretonian's born, imagine a newcomer who's coming with three, five children. So a, a, a house with two or three bedrooms, you're gonna be, you're not gonna find it, okay? So that is, has uh, been challenged. I think the, the, I think the motivation, and we've been talking to our provincial government too, and, uh, and uh, in the province and the city of Fredericton and how the city can, embrace and how we can make the policies of, of um, making policies in, in, in terms of like uh, to make uh, affordable housing for 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 Freditonians but also in e-commerce right so uh, yeah so uh, it's, it, it's, it has been a challenge before COVID time now in COVID time it has been worse and uh, the I'm happy that there is some regulation that I've been talking about how to regulate the pricing because since COVID time the price has been going up and up and up and nobody can sort of like taking control of that, right? So I think in terms of an e-commerce when you come into Canada, yes, it's true like the federal government is helping you, but are you gonna be using yes, your, uh, your 100 does, uh, like your dozen dollars uh, just to pay rent? And you have to have your allowance, food allowance, your medication and schooling for your children, right? So uh, definitely and certainly this is, has to be a call for our provincial government, but also the federal government, that it has to be, they have to invest, they have to be commit uh, to uh, make some uh, adjustment. And, uh, and, and once again, this is not just newcomers. This is a problem for New Brunswick. This is a problem for from Canada. And uh, why I'm saying that is because when we get the influx of, of Syrian, for example, uh, Toronto was saying, we don't have more space. We don't have housing. And Vancouver the same. So the MCF, the Multicultural Association of Fredericton, say yes, send us more families getting Fredericton, and we end up hosting more families, right? So at the time, right now, I think it's not just Toronto, not Vancouver, the biggest center. It's it's a problem here. So the motivation, uh, uh, what I'm seeing with this and uh, uh, science institution too, like working with e-commerce, I think there we should be some policies, some talk, how to improve housing in the province of New Brunswick. Well, once again, this is not just a newcomer thing. I want to emphasize that because sometimes we misunderstanding that, oh, because there are newcomers. No, this is a problem from the province of New Brunswick. Thank you, Jeremias. That concludes the questions for you guys.